I think I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started and I'll just welcome everybody uh, joining our room to uh, this panel discussion on music and memory, a look into the power of music for Alzheimer's disease. My name is Josh Grill. I'm an Alzheimer's disease researcher at the University of California at Irvine and a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for HFC. It's really my great honor to be a part of today's panel, which has an incredible powerhouse lineup of uh, speakers, contributors. Um, I'm going to give most of the time to this incredible panel, but I wanted to begin by just making sure everyone in the audience understands how important music is to human beings. Um, evidence tells us that music has been around essentially as long as modern human beings have been, dating back to Paleolithic times, we can find evidence of instruments that were created 35,000 years ago. And from birth, music activates the brain differently than do other sounds that lack melody, rhythm, or tone. Um, so this is a powerful influence on the way our brain functions. In fact, it seems to activate the pleasure centers of our brain, uh, resulting in it being in evolutionarily conserved. And Music can work to the betterment of humans and can even be used as therapies for diseases, including diseases of the brain. And our panel is gonna share with us their experiences and how music affected their own lives, which obviously the music is, is important to them, um, but also their interactions and relationships as it relates to people they loved with Alzheimer's disease. So. I think it's a really fascinating topic and a great one. And I'm, uh, I'm again, so honored and thrilled to be a part of this. Um, I'm gonna start with Wayne Brady. And I'm sure everyone knows that Wayne is a multiple Emmy award winning and Grammy award winning actor, producer, singer, dancer, and songwriter. Um, and he has shared that he had a grandmother uh, who I believe was instrumental in his upbringing um, who also suffered from dementia. Wayne, could you tell us a little bit about that and how music was important to your relationship with her? Thank you so much, Josh. Um, uh, how do I even begin to thank my grandmother? Uh, growing up in the household that I grew up in, my folks are from the US Virgin Islands, St. Thomas and St. Croix, but I was raised in Orlando, Florida. So from an early age, I, I grew up with music in the house 24 seven, but I had such such a melting pot. It was um, it was soca music, reggae music, um, just just straight up um, Caribbean music, show tunes, country, um, rap, and every single bit of music that you could think of. My grandparents were into. Luckily for me. And that's why late later on becoming a singer and a, and a stage performer and later an improviser becoming well well known for musical improv i was able to pull on all of those influences growing up so i've always thanked my grandmother for for also making it okay for you know a little black kid growing up in the neighborhood that i grew up in to listen to every single thing under the sun and to open my mind and my perceptions to it. And I really feel that to this day, it's because of music that I'm able to think the way that I think. Because mm -hmm. the, the, you know, in uh, improv and comedy, you know, the yes and piece def definitely goes the same for music. It's yes and, you're stacking chords and melodies and, and building on it. That's why jazz is such an incredible, incredible art. All, all, all of that built me and I have her to thank for it. Mm. That's fantastic. We're gonna let the panelists play off of each other, but I'm gonna try to give everybody a question to get us started. I'm gonna turn now to Joey McIntyre, uh, who everyone knows is part of the, the world sensation, New Kids on the Block. Um, but I didn't know that Joey is one of nine children um, and that your mom, Catherine, uh, has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So obviously music has been fundamental to your life, um, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about it how music impacts your relationship with your mom. Yeah, um, well, we were the, um, there was nine of us. So the, our, our household was, it was, uh, it was showtime from the minute, you know, <laughs> the first foot hit the floor off the bed. And um, there was a lot of love, there was a lot of drama, uh, but music was a huge part of it, of course. Um, 
I had seven older sisters, so it was a lot of dance music. You know, the kitchen was like a disco. And my mom's big escape from having nine kids was community theater. And um, she would get away and she would just light up. You know, it was called the Footlight Club. It was actually the oldest community theater in America. And uh, it was just this beautiful place. And, and I saw the connection she had, you know, when you see how how much fun someone's having and up on stage, you know it's it's the perfect pull for you to go. Wow, that must be fun. I should try it out. And um, you know, of course, I, I think a lot of people can relate. There's something about music that, you know, that's, you know, w when when the dementia sets in, Alzheimer's sets in, and they start losing faculties and memories, and they they never let go of the music especially of their childhood you know and and i know i'm sure a lot of caregivers are so grateful for those am stations that are still playing the golden oldies you know and um you know word for word you know still there and just really keeps us going through this you know bitter bitter time i mean it it, it makes it somehow i i feel like when, when it really hit my mom she was in her 70s she was in her late 70s and um you know it's everybody has a different story but it's there's there's sweetness it's bittersweet you know as painful as this experience is you know there's so much sweetness and tenderness after my mom got through the you know paranoia and the darkness and and then kind of just kind of chilled out um you know we would just sit around and and sing songs and and connect that way through music Thank you for that. You know, there's actually some incredible studies about the degenerative process of Alzheimer's disease and the parts of the brain that are affected most profoundly compared to the parts of the brain that are um, responsible for music memory and long-term music memory. And they're actually quite non-overlapping, meaning that the parts of the brain that are responsible for musical memory stay intact longer, even late into the disease, which lets people with Alzheimer's disease still respond to music in such a important, powerful way. Um, I'm going to turn to Ashley Campbell. And Ashley, uh, you're an amazing singer songwriter, but you and your dad, Glenn, let the world into part of his journey with Alzheimer's disease in the documentary film. Um, describing his last tour in which you were a part of it. Um, and we were all saddened uh, when you and the world lost your dad. Um, has music been important to your healing process? And I'm sure it's uh, tied to many of your memories. Yeah, music has always been a healing thing for me. And, and it's been a part of my life since, you know, since I was born, just being Glenn Campbell's daughter, you're always around Glenn Campbell's music at least. Um, but yeah, like it's interesting, uh, because music was so therapeutic for my dad and, and he was able to perform well into his struggle with Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. still, you know, reach those memories that were so deeply embedded in him. Um, it's, it's become a part of me as well. And a part of the healing process, like when he passed away, I, I remember thinking to myself, like making a conscious decision that. I was not going to let listening to his music make me sad. Mm -hmm. um, instead, I chose to think of it as a positive thing, like that whenever I listen to his music, he's with me still and his lessons that he taught me come up and everything like that. Um, and every time I play uh, my own concerts and perform for people, like I just, I feel everything that he taught me about music coming through. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, music is very, very powerful. Thank goodness. Uh, Nicholas, um, you are the, uh, the front man of the hit band Walk the Moon. Um, and you're, you're, my kids sing your song, Shut Up and Dance, all the time in our house. Um, but I've had the pleasure of hearing you describe uh, your story about you and your dad um, and the impact uh, Alzheimer's disease had on, on your life um, and how you've used music as a, an outlet for the emotions you felt around your dad and his disease. I, I'd love for other people to get a chance to hear you talk about that. Mm, thank you. 
Um, and thank you, thank you everyone here. Thank you everyone to, who's attending. Thank you HFC. I'm just so present to how important it is to have a space like this for us to talk about the real stuff. You know, um, it's awesome to experience um, each of us artists and, and whatever we're into you know, in our magic, but to also come together as just human beings and talk about our life experience. I'm just really present to how powerful and important this is. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my, my, my father had early onset Alzheimer's that it, it, it started to hit him at age 49 when I was 15. Um, and, and, uh, like, like, uh, like Joey and, and, and Wayne, um, and is it Ashley, Ashley Campbell, um, the, uh, And my my father especially was a huge fan of music, and I credit him for my for getting me into music and being my entry point to uh, being an artist. And um, yeah, through the through the until the very very end, I mean, we we rolled a piano into into his room at the care center, and even when he uh, could barely, um, you know. Form a, form a sentence or, or feed himself, take care of himself at all. Um, he, you know, uh, he'd be just like tapping his little foot or he'd be, yeah. he'd be singing along, um, playing, the, you know, playing along the drum fills when we put on a, a track he loved. But, you know, it was, it was more than just that, that he would come awake to remember the music, but we would find um, when, when the, when music would come on that that uh, would would kind of awaken him, he would then for the next few minutes or maybe the next hour be in a different level of consciousness and be, be kind of like regain an ability to interact, um, to communicate. Um, it was a very mysterious thing. And um, I, I, I have it that we still don't fully understand um, the uh, the extent to which music can, can help and, and can heal. Hmm. I think that's true, but I'm going to turn to our final panelist who probably knows the, the best answer, and that's Dr. <laughs> Allen, who's the chair of music therapy uh, at the Berkeley School of Music. And so her, her, her career's work is around using music as a treatment. So maybe she can uh, answer that question. Thank you, Dr. Grill, and thank you for everyone um, letting me be on the panel with um, such esteemed colleagues as well. Um, I, I would start by saying, and tying back to what you started with, Dr. Grill, and that is, is that we're all inherently musical, right? It starts with our heartbeat, and the minute that heartbeat, it's a rhythm, and it's also metaphorically when there's something off, we know if our rhythm's off, we know that there's something that needs to be adjusted or readjusted um, right. as we go through life. and. Um, you know, I think the easiest way to connect some of these things is that, um, you know, knowing that we're inherently musical is just take a moment to go back to your own musical journey. Like everyone in this room, every one of our attendees and pa um, panelists and start with, um, you know, babies and how they respond to sound. And that sound source allows them within development to not only bond with caregivers, but also to start learning. Um, they're responding to sound. They're turning toward the sound source. When they start babbling and we return we're babbling with them. It's they're responding to and connecting with. And those are some of those key things that we continue on through life, that response, that connecting to motor movement. Um, I'm reaching for the bells that make the sound as a baby. But then when we become um, toddlers, we use music to learn concepts. I mean, all of us learned through our ABCs, right? Um, twinkle, twinkle, little star. We learned song stories. Um, everyone remember the cleanup song, um, how we learned how to do task, right? Somehow my kids have forgotten that. But anyway, um, we learned through that. Then when we get into elementary school, music really becomes a way for social, social interaction. Some of us were in choirs or bands, and it wasn't about the Grammys. It wasn't about, you know, the big performance. It was about being in community with others and learning through others and um, learning concepts through others. And then in adolescence, um, it becomes more of that emotional connection that we have. And how many of you remember 
um, key moments in your adolescence with songs that were there in the stories of your life, whether it was the first concert you went to, the first song um, that came on a radio at a pivotal emotional time, whether it was a relationship that you were in with or dancing with friends. Um, you know, and, and then as we continue to age and grow, we still always have music there. And that's been something that we know that we connect with. And, you know, as we get into um, older adults, we still need that and know that we still respond physically. You might catch yourself all of a sudden tapping your toes to something or swaying to music or dancing to shut up and dance with me, right? <laughs> um, um, but you also respond emotionally. How many times when you're watching a movie and you hear that soundtrack and it brings you back and you, or you catch yourself with tears, uh, might be tears of sadness or tears of joy, or when you're exercising, it helps with that motivation aspect. To the same thing, music helps you socially in connection to cognitively. How many people, you know, remember things by putting a little jingle to it and or vice versa, you have a jingle from a commercial stuck in your head. It's been ingrained in there. Um, or a spiritual connection, because we can't forget that and that spirituality and that connection to something outside of ourselves and a higher being. But my whole point with all of that is thinking that, you know, think about your own relationship to music throughout your life. And it's those same principles that we use as music therapists and looking to say, OK, what is it that they need in this moment? Do they need to feel connected to something? Do they need a physical release? Do they need motivation? Do they need something to help them calm down? Um, what is it that they need? And then we can help build those music experiences to make the, make the situation a little bit better. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, I think you've, you've walked us through, you know, the lifespan of the Sorry. importance of music. No, it was great. It was great. It was the lifespan of the importance of music. And I totally agree. I mean, I think that it, it also, you know, clearly remains uh, important through the journey of, of a loved one with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So maybe I'll, I'll kind of quickly go through our panel and just ask everybody if, if there's a particular memory or current uh, time when music is really vital to your relationship with your your loved one who's dealing with dementia. I mean, I've had people tell me that it helps, you know, bouts of agitation or getting through particular needs um, around daily activities, doctor's visits, et cetera. There are strategic ways that we can leverage the power of music. So if you have um, a pearl in that regard or just a favorite memory about music with your loved one, I think that'd be great for our audience to hear. Wayne, I'll start with you. Um, last year, it's been about a year exactly when I lost my grandmother um, after her, her battle with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, as everyone here knows, the it takes a second to to find your footing and find what works, right? What gets through, what breaks through the fog and what brings them back. And I found out quickly with my grandmother that it was the music. And I, I, I've got a couple memories of, I learned quickly that the weird thing was she wouldn't recognize me in person sometimes, but she would watch my during the day, she would watch my, my, my show, Let's Make a Deal, or if she was watching anything else that I did that had a little bit of music to it. So when my aunt called me and said, when, when you start to sing, not necessarily when you start to speak, but when you start to sing, she goes, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's what's his name, that's my, and, and so she knew that it was Wayne and it, it came to her. So I decided that, um, I would do a musical sign off to her some sometimes. So at the end of the show, I would either say, say bye bye mama or bye mama, or I'd sing, sing it to her. And I would send her uh, vid videos er er every day on the phone of me singing to her. And then I would get different, um, uh, like like when I, um, I, I did a musical a little while ago, a few years ago, I did uh, ha Hamilton and, uh, and also Kinky Boots. And I would, would sneak little, black market vi videos sorry production team <laughs> I, I would sneak these videos to her and when she would watch me singing and doing that and she would listen all of a sudden she recognized her boy and to me that was the coolest thing because i knew that i still had a piece of my lady with me mm. that's amazing 
Joey, particular memory or, or strategy that was important? Yeah, I mean, I was, my mom, I'm the youngest of nine kids, so there was almost two generations between us. So, um, again, the old standards, it was almost like, you know, you, you talk about how, how Joey was talking about this lifelong process. It's almost like this soothing music, you know, everything... Even the family, we know that it's it's really uh, stressful on the family and the caregivers. So everybody would stop, you know, they're hemming and hawing, whatever they brought in with them, everything would stop with the music. You know, you get together and you sing those old songs that everybody loves, you know, and she knows every word. And and everybody just has a break from the from the craziness or the sadness or the, the stress of it. And, and that was just like, such a part of it it's uh, it somehow you know gave us gave us a respite from you know what we were all going through um so yeah that's that's grateful for that yeah that, that's really important it's a long journey um and you you need to find ways to still feel joy through that journey and music is a great way to do that uh ashley specific yeah. memory that you want to share um well, through the documentary, I mean, the whole, anyone who watches it could see, you know, my dad's connection with music, but it's, for me, what sticks out in my memory is what happened after, after the documentary ends. Um, Cause I, I was one of his primary caregivers uh, all the way until the end. I mean, he was in a care community um, a couple of years before he passed, but you know, eventually he got aphasia, he lost his ability to speak and communicate. And, mm -hmm. and then eventually the total fog hit and he, you know, wouldn't even see you within a foot of his face, you know, even not even. Um, so, you know, you just never could be sure what he was aware of around him. So I would just go sit in his room with a guitar and I would play songs mm -hmm. that I knew he loved and just even practice my own stuff sometimes. And uh, what really made it special and, and really worth it for me was um, maybe I could be playing for like 20 or 30 minutes, but if he, and he wouldn't know I was there, but sometimes just for 15 seconds, he would start tapping his toe along with what I was doing. So we have no idea if he heard the whole thing or if he just tuned it for that moment, but the point is that the music reached him on some level and i thought that was really special yeah kind of giving you a chance to feel like things were the way they once were even for a brief moment mm -hmm. nicholas a special memory you'd like to share hmm. well i mentioned uh when he was in the care center you know we we'd play records for him i'd uh, bring in a keyboard or the piano and, and play for him and um it, it always, it, you know, it was, it was never a bad idea. <laughs> like it always, it always helped in some way, um, even subtly. And it was always worth, worth whatever effort um, to create, uh, just to bring music into his world. Um, Honestly, the thing that the thing that I, it keeps coming to mind as as people are speaking is that one one of our favorite things to do was was just to drive in the car and listen to music, and um, you know we did that as long as as long as we could until uh, until he was in a home it was more uh, challenging you know to move him, and um, like I guess that that just makes me want to say you know that there there I know there are caregivers and 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 people here watching who, who have a family member now who's experiencing this. And something that um, I found myself looking back on is like, wow, you know, it's so simple just sitting there and listening to music with, with my dad um, in the car. And um, just to, it just made me want to remind anyone, everyone who's got, uh, who's, who's got a family member. It's like, each each new stage, you know, you can feel when there's kind of a shift and, and there's a new stage of, of where they're at and what they're able to interact with and experience. And just to, even though in those moments it's like, oh, like you're still you're feeling the pain of what's lost, but there's still so much that's present. There's still so much there that you can enjoy, even these really simple things. So I just 
I just want to encourage everyone who's got a family member with Alzheimer's now to really enjoy what is here um, because that, that's precious and, and that, that can be a friend to you uh, in, in you know, the stages that, that, that go on that become more challenging. That's, that's great. Um, it actually is where I was going to go next. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Dr. Allen another chance and then I'm going to ask you each uh, the same question one more time, which is about using music as a therapy for yourself. And I know mm -hmm. you all can't imagine a day without music. I'm sure of that. Um, but are there specific ways you use music as a as a therapy for your own health, well-being, mental or physical? And and Dr. Allen, you know, maybe you could offer our audience a little bit on that before our panel takes their turn. Sure. Um, I think that I think you just picked up on a key thing: using it yourself therapeutically. So even with everyone thing that everyone has shared, you know, thinking about things like moving to music and how you know maybe it's during some of the transition times of you know trying to do activities of daily living or dressing or changing that get really difficult and you know can you turn that into a positive um moment by using song and singing and the very act of singing you're taking in breath right and that automatically is going to help with the um, heart rate and respiratory rate which is going to help mm. with anxiety believe it or not so even you know, it's not about the quality of the song that you're singing. It's just sing and move with it and making it into something that becomes for both the caregiver and the patient a little bit more, um, I don't want to use the word distraction, but it makes it into something more pleasurable than trying to go through the motions, if that makes sense. And then, um, you know, even thinking about within caregivers, um, take five. Um, I always thinking about daily <clears throat> take five. Take five minutes if you're feeling that agitation and an anxiety. Um, others can pick up on that. And if you need to take the five minutes to, um, you know, scream outside um, in the shower, um, decompress yourself using music, um, putting on your own favorite song, um, you do a short relaxation that can make a big difference to get through the day. But then find those moments of joy together like you were just talking about, um, you know, whether it's, um, reviewing some of life's moments that you had using um, music-based life reviews or um, you're know, thinking about the environment and things of a favorite vacation and some of the musics and the sounds that were connected to that um, or favorite movies. Um, all of those things can make a big difference. Great. I think we only have about five minutes left, which is saddest to me, but I'm sure sad to our audience. So I'm going to try to do the rapid fire. Wayne Brady, do you self-medicate with music? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, I go to sleep to music. And also something that I would propose to, to our panel and anybody else listening, you know, um, the, the act of improvisation and, and association, that's something that, that I've started to, to leverage my own uh, teachings and everything in, into, especially working with, with my grandmother, being, being able to make these men mental connections and rhyming words. And, and it's more than just you, your rhyming words on top of a melody. The melody then pr produces a story. The story produces a vivid picture. The picture brings you back to a space and time. And then that equals con connection. That's something that I started thinking of once my grandmother got mm -hmm. sick because I was concerned about myself and wanting to begin the work now to make sure that my, my, that I do do all the work that I can to to maybe keep my my connections in place so mm -hmm. i would say to to all of you it, it it may sound silly make up a song in the mirror make up a song Absolutely. in the car make up a song in the shower and you're not trying to write a hit you're, you're just trying to connect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome yeah we always are recommending people to stay cognitively active uh, so try to lower your risk for later life cognitive decline and you just described a great way joey mm -hmm. self-medication with music uh, yeah, I, honestly, it's, this is a great reminder. Um, you know, I've, I've lived and made my living in music, you know, my whole life, but I, I have to remember what a simple gift it is. And, and, you know, yeah, I'll take that advice, you know, Wayne, as far as like writing a song and not judging it so much and, you know, just, um, it's about the practice, you know, it, it's about, I think we're all talking about what it does to us metaphysically and spiritually and getting our energy up and, and kind of shaking out all the, you know, the stress and, and, um, 
Yeah, and I and I do do that, but I it, to recognize it is is important, you know, to really recognize it for for the for the wonderful free gift that it is. Nice, Ashley. How about you? I I mean I think everyone self medicates with music on some level, um, but I was just thinking about when I specifically go to music to escape or something like that it's kind of fun to use it as a, a sort of time travel. Mm -hmm. I mm. like to think of yeah. albums or songs that I used to listen to at very specific moments in my life, usually moments of great optimism when I was younger and hope and things like that. Um, and kind of revisit those older versions of myself and connect with them to, to realize that it's all me, but it's, it's really cool to see a growth and also just to connect with who I was and who I am, you know? So it's really fun to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that. Nicholas. Yeah, I mean, my path with my, my father brought me, I'm sure as everyone here understands, you know, to the, the depths of, of, of um, you know, some of the most, the deepest sorrow I've ever experienced. And through that, that, you know, it became a gift to me to, uh, to have touched loss, to have touched um, uh, that 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 very universal human um, pain and music, it actually opened up it like in the reverse. It really opened up my my world of music to to be able to create um, in a deeper way and to connect with music and connect with others in, in a deeper way. So. As far as music as therapy, I, I see music or, or any art, any any way that you feel creative, any any way that that um, you can transmute, you know, take take your feelings and, and make it into something, turn it into something, uh, just make something with it, you know, make it something productive or, uh, uh, you know, it could be as simple as a song in the mirror or um, or a doodle on a page um, or a, you know a journal entry and, and a poem, but to to release those feelings and. And more often than not, they become something quite beautiful, um, and that others may may find permission and may find joy from as well. Mm. If, if you guys have questions for each other, that's a okay too. But here's one more for me. Um, one of my favorite studies of music goes back many years. Uh, a brilliant neuroscientist wanted to put people in a brain scanner, who could reliably predict that a piece of music would give them the chills. Uh, he wanted to see what happened in the brain when someone experienced the chills, uh, <laughs> if you will, a deep pleasure because they like that piece of music so much. Um, and it's really one of the foundational studies that told us that music can affect neurochemistry. Um, these okay. parts of the brain that, you know, really react favorably, reward circuitry um, to music. Uh, are there pieces of music that, you know, tried and true can can do that to you? It doesn't have to necessarily be the hair on the back of your neck, but just reach you on this emotional level. And I'd be, I'm sure our audience would be so curious to hear what pieces of music do that for each of you. Mm. Um, Chicago 17, personally. Yeah. Oh, wow. You're the meaning in my life. Yeah. It's for it. You know, it's like that. <laughs> I'd love to see that. I mean, that makes so much sense. Like, I bet they could track the chills, you know? I love that. be able to track the chills. I love that, you know, that's out there. Yeah, all that, you know, that I era. I think you talk about the time travel of music. I mean, for me, that was... That was a big one. That 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 era is the the chill, the goosebump. Ooh, that's a good one. That's awesome. Mine would be um, uh, a song like uh, like a change is gonna come by Sam Cooke. Mm -hmm. Anything that Sam Cooke would sing that that would start off with that la ta da da that 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 horn like qual quality that just hits you. And it then transcends just a song. It's actually vibrating in you, and and that actually was one of my 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 grandmother's favorite songs, and that's why I grew up loving Sam Sam Cook. And so, I can just throw Sam on at any time, and it just takes me away. 
I think from this point forward, you have to give a song and sing a bit of it. So go <laughs> ahead, Ashley. <laughs> oh, gosh, my example is going to be kind of hard. <laughs> when I was in the third grade, I latched on to the film Amadeus. Uh, yes. which is such a weird film for a third grader to be obsessed with but i watched it every single day and i listened to the soundtrack in the car i'd sit in the back and conduct the orchestra and it's this song from the marriage of figaro where uh the lead character salieri is describing uh these people arguing and and then apologizing and then forgiving and all of it is in perfect harmony. And just the combination of notes in that, in that one part of that opera just give me chills every time. Mm. <laughs> A third grader with great taste. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very sophisticated. <laughs> Yeah, I had a, a a retainer that that had W A M Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart <laughs> written on it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. now it's a top two, right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Nicholas, how about you? Endless. Yeah. My love has come along. Yeah. Come oh. on. <laughs> come on. Yeah. Every time. Every time. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I think uh I think it it's it's an incredible powerful force um that we should all use for good right we have uh we have one minute um left in this in this panel and then folks are going to be directed back to the main stage any any last thoughts i'll just add that you don't we, we talked a lot about singing but playing an instrument is just as valid and you know whether um it was something that you put down for 30 40 years there's still pick it up um and it's never too late to learn i mean there's simple ways to learn piano there's simple ways to learn guitar and it keeps you active but it also gives you meaning and purpose so mm. <laughs> yes, sir. all right so i think we're down to seconds and i just want to again thank this incredible panel um really an honor for me to get to do this with you um, i'm going to direct our audience back to the main stage where seth and warren are going to be presenting an award um, how amazing is it that they put together such a remarkable event inclusive of such wonderful people? So thank you to all. Um, enjoy the rest of CareCom. Yeah. Nice. Thank you, you. everybody. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.